Are these only monuments to the dead past, or do they hold the key to the future? The church today must make its great, perhaps its greatest, decision. The dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki has caused thoughtful controversy in the United States. Was it right to use the bomb to save American lives? Wrong, because it killed innocent civilians. Does a bomb really end a war, or does it simply make the existing war more inhuman? Today, thinking people are asking this question. Hasn't the bomb left the church with a twofold responsibility? First, to see that moral law is applied in world affairs so that war and the bomb are eventually outlawed. Second, to see that atomic energy is employed for useful ends and not merely for human destruction. This bomb, the most devastating weapon man has ever created. This is what it did at Bikini in 1946, and today this model may be obsolete. We built this bomb, and we used it twice. Let us ask ourselves why. Was it right? What led up to its use? It began in Washington, December 7, 1941. Japanese emissaries Nomura and Kurusu calling upon the American Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Their mission, peace. Their purpose, negotiations. And on that same December day, one hour earlier, this, December 7, 1941, Japanese planes over Pearl Harbor, a sneak attack launched against the United States. was heavy, the cost high. 2,343 fighting men dead, 968 missing, 876 wounded, a fleet decimated, a nation enraged. We were shocked and angry, and our pattern of war was quickly determined. Our national attitude fixed, stated by the President, affirmed by the Congress, avowed by the people. Next day, a grim Franklin Roosevelt came before the Congress of the United States. in our armed forces with the unbounding determination of our people. We will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. went to war, trained our men, hardened them, put 15 million under arms. And when they were ready, we sent millions overseas to fight a global war. <laughs> Meanwhile, behind the scenes, a battle more important than Salerno or Normandy Beach, Corregidor or Guadalcanal was taking place at home. It was fought in the laboratory and in the factory, much of it here at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The nations of the world were embarked upon a desperate race to harm to our civilization. There was no question in the minds of our leaders as to what would happen if one of our enemies perfected the bomb first.
later, we saw first-hand evidence that our fears of enemy competition in the field of atomic energy were well justified. Here, our troops in Tokyo discover a Japanese cyclotron. Like many other nations, Japan was seriously engaged in the race for atomic secrets. We won that race. We saw the cataclysmic demonstration of our victory here at Los Alamos in the New Mexico desert. And now our leaders had to make a terrible and frightening decision, whether to use the bomb as a military weapon or merely as a threat. Basically, the decision was the president's. Mr. Truman believed then and believes today that to use the bomb would save the lives of a quarter of a million Americans on the invasion beaches of Japan alone. Them, Harry Truman had sent Japan surrender terms and a warning of impending and irrevocable defeat. His terms and his warning were not only rejected by the Japanese warlords, they were ridiculed. The president's advisors were Henry L. Stimson, Robert Patterson, General George C. Marshall, James F. Burns, J.R. Oppenheimer and General Grove. Dr. Vannevar Bush, Dr. Arthur H. Compton, Bernard Baruch, James Conant, and Carl Compton, Dr. E. O. Lawrence. What were the president and his advisors thinking of as they pondered their decision? Searing their memories were the horrors of the Pacific War. Corregidor, Guam, Tarawa, Elileo, the inch-by-inch inch fighting in the hot, steaming jungles where death was everywhere. They remembered Iwo Jima, and the flag going up on Mount Suribachi. But at what a price. They remembered the Manila we returned to. Sack, village, a gutted shell. And they remembered the people of Manila, the well walking with the aimless bewilderment of those who have nowhere to go. The injured, the wounded, and the tortured begging for aid. The dead in the streets, thrown in the gutters like refuse. And then there was China, could they forget the Japanese savagery there? There was another consideration. Our bombing raids were taking an appalling toll on Japan. One firebomb attack on Tokyo, 125,000 dead. Another raid, 100,000 dead. There were thousands of Japanese lives that could also be saved by an abrupt cessation of hostilities. On the basis of the known facts, a frontal attack on Japan was expected to cost us a million casualties. For the Japanese, fighting to save face for themselves and their emperor would make home defense a holy mission. The warning had been disregarded. The decision was made. Drop the bomb on Japan. The first target was selected, Hiroshima. remains of Hiroshima. The bomb, now an obsolete model, obliterated 60% of this important army center. Of 343,000 inhabitants, 80,000 were killed. Three days later, Nagasaki.
The bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was an improved model, and it was later revealed to be the last one we had. In this key naval center, a city of 253,000, 40,000 were killed. Of Nagasaki, little remains. In Hiroshima and Nagasaki, thousands suffered horrible flash burns. Thousands more, without a mark on their bodies, sickened and died from the effects of radioactivity. In the hearts of some, there was a quick response, compassion, pity, a desire to help. But are these the only reactions? What of those who say they had their warning? This is the price that must be paid. Yes, the damage is done. The church and mercy workers must and are continuing their historic mission of doing everything in their power to relieve the suffering. Instead of arguing over what caused the greater havoc, fire bombs on Tokyo or atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, should not the church insist that these people be the last victims of organized mass warfare? Whatever our religious faith, is it not our duty to do more than refuse reparations from Japan and assist in that nation's rehabilitation? Shall we not provide scholarships for Japanese students in American universities, extend our missionary work among her people? Shall we not imbue them with a working religious faith without which democracy cannot succeed? Today, atomic war, the war of the laboratory, means mass suicide. There is no chivalry in mass murder, no gallantry in supersonic, electronic, atomic war. The new scientific weapons man has devised can only lead to universal destruction. These are the sounds of war today. With these sounds in our ears, the church must make a great decision. Religious leaders of all faiths must bear their full share of responsibility, and so must you and I. The mere existence of moral law cannot stop atomic war. We know that now, because a war that can be precipitated in a moment by a few men of ill will destroys the potency of moral law. This alters the church's traditional policy of condemning only aggressive war while condoning defensive war. Can it justify war today under any circumstances? We cannot await another war to make our decision, for another war will know no end save us. Unless the church takes the initiative now and uses its moral force to outlaw war, is it not inevitable that the church, 
and with it, civilization will surely perish.